speaking with you today about bringing digital libraries into view on an individual's information horizon. Let's begin with a story about an engineer. This is a fictional story, even though this is a picture of a real engineer. But let's pretend for a minute. Pretend that this is Jane Ingram. She's an electrical engineer. She completed her bachelor, uh, bachelor's degree in 1995 and then a master's degree in 1996 in electrical engineering at Tufts University in Massachusetts. She's now working for a large firm in the Boston area that develops and manufactures control devices of various types, and she's directly involved in new product development. Personally, Jane is married and has two daughters, Jessica Four and Savannah Seven. Her husband, Kenny, is a musician, composing and performing electronic music. They actually met when he was taking some electrical engineering courses as part of his multimedia arts degree at Tufts. She and Kenny both enjoy camping and backpacking and take the girls along on short treks. Kenny's performing career often takes them to Europe, though Jane does not go along nearly so often as she did before Savannah was born. At home, they have lots of electronic equipment, including Kenny's performance studio. Jane often brings her laptop home from work, um, but when she does go on the internet, she tends to use the home computer that they have, the family's home computer. So next, let's consider Jane's information horizon. Let me explain what an information horizon is, and these ideas are based on Simon Walls and Johnson's work on this idea. It's really a metaphor, meaning that some things are close, and some are far, and some are completely out of sight, meaning they're beyond your horizon. And uh, formally, it's the individual's context for information seeking. It contains resources and carriers of information, but it also includes constraints on the use of those resources. We're going to examine Jane's information horizon from the perspective of a particular sense-making gap she has experienced. As an engineer, she's currently working on ideas for a new device for heating and cooling controls in so-called green buildings. She wants to develop a device that can detect when a particular window is open so that the heating and cooling system can be shut down or its use lessened in that room or the other area or similar area when, uh, when the window is open. Other relevant characteristics for this problem include the size of the room in which the window is open, the difference between the indoor and outdoor temperatures, and the relationship between the thermostat setting for the room and the room temp and the outdoor and then the room temperature. Uh, the goal is to minimize the use of power for heating and cooling while simultaneously maximizing the comfort of the building inhabitants. Jane has not worked on thermostats or temperature controls for a few years, so she needs more details on current, current thermostat systems. From what we know of engineers' information seeking behaviors, we expect first she would seek out interpersonal colleagues, interpersonal sources, such as her own work team, other engineers within her own firm, and also colleagues she has, peers in the Women's Engineering Society. She also might um, call on her personal library, the things she has in her own office to try to refresh her on what she knows already. Only if she were dissatisfied with her knowledge after using these sources would she be likely to pursue additional sources. Things like the tech reports that have been written within the firm, um, resources that are available in the firm's library, or um, journal articles that she might find by searching a database like InSpec. Those sources we might consider of higher quality, of very high quality, um, possibly higher quality than the sources sh she consulted first. So let's think next about the place of those digital libraries in this information horizon. Um, and here's where we need to probably clarify, what do we mean exactly by a digital library? Um, I don't want to go into that in a lot of detail, but for our purposes here, we'll include any formal collection of information resources that are available in digital form. So a very loose definition. In this situation, information resources are being used to make sense of Jane's current um, situation. She's trying to bridge information gaps or discontinuities that she has perceived in her situation. I think there's two factors that can really strongly affect the positioning of information resources on an individual's information horizon. The first of these is probably something you would guess, accessibility. How easy is it to obtain the information that she wants? Um, her personal library, for instance, is more accessible than the firm's library because it's, it's just physically closer to her. It may not be as up to date, it may not be as complete, but it's really close. The second um, factor is something I don't think we think about a lot, but I think it is important, and that is that some resources play multiple roles. 
some resources provide affective uh, interactions as well as informative interactions. Those interpersonal resources that we call on may not be all that authoritative in the information they provide, but they do provide social support in addition to the information they provide. So for example, her work team, at least some of its members, would provide regular collegial support, as do her colleagues from the Women's Engineering Society. The more formal resources provide information, but they rarely or never provide social support. Our goal then for Jane's Information Horizon is to try to bring those formal sources, things that we would consider to be of very high quality, closer to her on her horizon, right? They, they, she would see them first. So how do we do that? If we address those two main factors, the first one is to try to make them more accessible. Physically accessible, we might be able to bring materials to her desktop, right into her office. Certainly digital materials could be delivered that way. Um, even delivery of books and printed materials, the um, firm library might be able to deliver them to her office rather than having her come to the library for them. We can also think in terms of intellectual accessibility. They, uh, we could develop better resource discovery tools that might bring all those resources closer to her. The second thing to think about, I think, is trying to add some type of social support dimension to this interaction. Uh, so if we organize the library staff to work with particular teams of engineers, focusing on those teams' information needs, then the library staff can be in the position of actually anticipating the information needs of those engineers. So for example, if the library knows of Jane's new assignment to work on thermostats, as soon as she does, then they can begin working on finding information resources as quickly as she can. Um, they can already try to run some inspect searches, retrieve some articles that they think will be really useful to her, um, state-of-the-art reviews, that kind of thing, that they can get to her before she even has asked for them. Um, then they can use follow-up phone calls or visits to the office to try to discuss them and to try to really develop a strong collegial relationship with Jane. In general, what I'm proposing is that uh, libraries should move beyond helping people find information to helping people use information. I think there are already some uh, libraries beginning to experiment with services that support people when using information. And we're going to discuss four different types of uh, ways that services can be provided um, in, in relationship to use. First of all, services supporting reuse of existing information, services supporting the creation of new information objects, services supporting learning, and services supporting people helping people for collaboration. Okay, so let's think first about services supporting reuse of existing information. Um, there are a couple of different ways in which information might be reused. Uh, the first of these is just incorporating pieces of it in some other creation. So you have a chunk of something and you're going to just include that chunk in something else. So for example, a quotation would be included in an article. Um, a diagram might be included in a class lecture. Um, so those are a couple of examples of just taking one thing that exists and incorporating a piece of it in something else. Another way might be to modify it in some way. So for example, I might use various filters to alter the appearance of a digital photo uh, before reusing it in some way. I've put up the um, screenshot of the Open Video uh, website as an example of uh, an attempt to try to support reuse of digital video. One of the design decisions we made was to make full files available, downloadable, um, so that people could reuse them. Um, so we're trying to support users in reusing individual frames from a video, particular scenes from a video, or full videos. So now you're thinking, there's some copyright issues associated with reuse. What do we do about that? And my feeling about that is we should be careful, but we should not be too careful. Um, I th really think it's one of our professional responsibilities to advocate for more access to information. In the debates about access, we should be speaking on behalf of the users of the information and let the creators speak for themselves. So I hope you will advocate uh, for more open access. The second type of service is su services supporting the creation of new information objects, where you're going to create something new. Um, often this requires a su substantial investment in hardware and software tools to support that creation process. And some libraries are beginning to set up labs or studios to support their users in the process of creating new objects. So for example, 
We have uh, pictures here from the NC State University Digital Media Lab and the Florida State um, Digital Media Lab. Both of those are oriented toward photo and video editing equipment um, they're providing to students and faculty there. Over here we have a picture of the um, online herbarium set up from the University of Virginia. Um, they're trying to create images of plants. So you can see like they have the scanner, but it's like got all these special lighting things so they can pick up the 3D aspects of those plants. And then over here, an example from Australia, where they have a music um, editing setup. So they have hardware for creating and editing digital music. I think in all these ways, librarians are providing an infrastructure that will support their users' creativity. Another uh, type of service is services supporting learning. Now, libraries have traditionally seen themselves as providing support for education. We have school libraries, we have university libraries with a very explicit educational role. We have public libraries um, who work as an auxiliary institution educating citizens so they can act in a, in a democracy. But I want us to really be careful and try to broaden the scope of this concept to make sure we're really including both education, meaning teaching, and learning, more driven from the user's end of it. So I have some um, examples again. This uh, type of example we're very familiar with, uh, we provide classes of some kind, instruction very explicitly in group settings in the library. We also often do this, um, providing one-on-one -on -one learning assistance either for um, information about particular topics as in a reference kind of setting or one-on-one um, -on -one help with technology to um, find additional information. And then finally, uh, libraries can provide a context for individual learning. Um, we have this expectation that people want to be independent learning, learners and they demonstrate that, that that expectation is true over and over again. In addition to these kind of fairly traditional um, services I think that libraries provide, I hope we will continue to generate new ways in which we can help people learn. So for example, um, when you think about a digital information object, the kinds of objects we you know, traditionally provide, journal articles, books, that kind of thing, think about them becoming much more active. And so the object in itself actually provides more support for learning than is available from it in its current form. I think libraries have a role in getting involved in the development of such online learning tools either standalone learning tools or augmentations of other information objects. Finally, I think libraries should uh, provide services supporting people helping other people, like collaboration. Uh, bringing the people together again is a traditional role for libraries in which people can meet each other and engage in discussions of mutual interest face to face. Um, the Learning Commons at NC State University as a, a contemporary example of that, they just opened this learning comment, commons. It is a space that belongs to the users. Um, it is a space that they can rearrange to fit their needs. In this picture, you can see the rolling whiteboard, which they can move and they can regroup chairs so that they can work together or individually. In pairs, very casual interactions. There are also little tents um, that they can use to surround themselves and make group spaces that are more private or individual spaces that are more private. Um, all of those are kind of in the traditional face-to-face -face mode of collaboration, but technology can enable similar meetings among those who are not physically close together. So these other two examples are using technology in that way. We have a collaboration center here at the Health Sciences Library at UNC. It has this big uh, video wall, uh, video conferencing capabilities. All of those will support researchers in their collaborations. These other pictures of, are of the Access Grid, um, funded by the National Center for eSocial Science in the UK. It's a national program designed for social science researchers to be able to share computing facilities and data. It's not a library initiative, but it certainly could be. So in closing, I suggest a few ways in which libraries might make their resources more visible to their potential users. I'm hopeful that you'll come up with additional ways that your library can help people find and use information more effectively. Thank you.